then we start right now. It's 4.30, our last web talk of the series of artistic freedom between autonomy and responsibility starts right now. And we are here um, in our web talks in the context of the Academy for Cultural Policy. The Association for Cultural Policy is also working international in various contexts with the Creative Europe Desk Culture, the Compendium of Cultural Policies and Trends and the German Contact Point for Europe for Citizens. They uh, address an international public and this is why we are particularly happy to discuss the topic of artistic freedom today with a view to international conditions. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, the author Hannah Koma from Belarus. Um, Dr. Svirak Pipat, the executive director of Free Muse, and Dr. Daniel Gard from the University of Hildesheim and head of the Arts Rights Justice Program. Welcome to our panel today. After uh, discussion, discussing the limits of artistic freedom, the principles of neutrality and the terms of uh, like, like cancel culture, we discussed the last web talk. Um, today, we will hear about the need to protect artists from censorship, persecution and threats. We invite you to ask questions like uh, every time to the speakers using the Q&A box provided. And before we start, we want to know from you in which area you are working and uh, also from where you are uh, connected to us today. Um, I start a little poll and um, it would be also nice if you write uh, directly into the chat, maybe from which town or which country you are attending us so that we can uh, get a little bit uh, in touch with you. You know, the webinar function is something um, special and we can't see you today, but we have uh, a lot of very interesting input and you can participate via the questions. So I wait just some more seconds. Let's see. We have um, a very great um, percentage of people choosing other <laughs> so this would be also nice uh, if you want to to share your um, your profession with us in the chat um, we have 29% um, uh, of the attendees are uh, doing cultural research maybe this is uh, due to the persons we invited to the panel we have um, some from cultural policy and also from cultural institutions so this is quite interesting maybe just press the little send button um, don't forget it um so that we can count every um input and i will close the poll thank you for giving us this little overview and now i'm pleased uh, to move over to the first input which today comes from dr svirak pipat he is the executive director of free muse an independent non-governmental organization that advocates for freedom of artistic expression and cultural diversity. And uh, Dr. Suryak Piplat studied fine arts and music and holds a PhD in public and international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh. He was director of Amnesty International London and executive executive director of Amnesty International Thailand and has previously worked as a producer and writer for documentary films. 
as executive director of Free Muse, Srirak devises a comprehensive approach to defend artistic freedom and cultural expression through research, advocacy, and policy influencing, working with local and international partners. And he will now present us the latest Free Muse report and contextualize uh, the real results for our discussion. Thank you, Srirak, and um, the stage is yours. Um, and greeting everyone, uh, all the participants. It's a pleasure for me to be here and share some of the, the views and research work that we have done so far. Um, let me start by introducing Free Muse, the organization that I'm going to present the report, uh, The State of Artistic Freedom uh, 2021. Uh, Free Muse is an, an organization uh, that focuses on artistic freedom. Uh, we monitor uh, violation of artistic freedoms. To put in differently, we monitor censorship worldwide in about 90 countries every year. And then based on this monitoring of censorship and other forms of restrictions of artistic freedom, we publish an annual report so that the world could see what happened in terms of censorship, uh, prosecution of, of artists uh, in various forms, and as well as other violations of human rights of those working in the arts and culture fields in particular. So that's what we do. Um, last year, certainly 2020, it was a very tough year for many, um, given the COVID situation, as well as the uh, other uh, restriction, other development that happened along the line of, uh, in terms of racial issues that are uh, emerging from last year. And we saw quite uh, very daunting pictures um, last year when many of us believe that because of uh, the closure of performances, concert, theater, and many of the art performance due to restriction of the pandemic, uh, situation of censorship and uh, other restriction of artistic freedom should be going down because things are quiet down. Um, our research found the opposite. It was a, a record high restrictions of artistic freedom since we started to document uh, uh, artistic freedom in the State of Artistic Freedom report. And there's a few factors that contribute to this. So let me start by giving a bit of a broader context. Uh, we live now in a, in a political economy context where the old forces, traditions that use censorship to silence opposition of voice continue um, without a, a limitation or minimizing. While at the same time, we have new forces that use censorship and other forms of silencing uh, others, whether that's the growth of nationalism. We found, for example, many think tanks and uh, research have shown an increasing number of um, uh, political parties that gain seats in the parliament in Europe, for example, in 14 countries where more right-wing parties gaining seats in the parliament or other research that shows a political party that take power has their policy shifting toward the rights, both economically and socially. And that's also indicates uh, limitation of uh, standing for human rights and democracy overall. And in emerging countries, we see a con continuation between religious body and conservative and right-wing groups such as religious nationalism in India and in Brazil. That was a two prime example of this emerging of the forces that make situation of censorship worse than a past decade or so, if you're looking at in terms of contribution. But now let's have a look at the empirical documents. Um, what the figures and number shows. Last year, we documented 978 cases from 89 countries. Um, the total figures would probably be much higher, but these are the number that we managed to verify, giving us a lot of information unclear. Uh, so the number might be uh, rather small in uh, compared to what's happening around the world in practice. But this number is enough for us to identify potential threats and risks and also uh, general trends that we've seen. 
So for example, we see an increasing level. The number of artists killed almost doubled last year, changing from nine to 17 in 2020. The number of artists being imprisoned increased by 15% in 2020 compared to the previous year. And that's the move from 71 to 82 artists. Prosecution grows four or five times, actually. Um, that's uh, 23 going up to 107. And we've seen 133. Like just yeah. one second. We can hear you uh, doing something on your table. So this is uh, affecting the microphone a, a, a lot. I just want to inform you. Okay. All right. And let's see if that's, uh, let me know if it's still making noises and so on. Um, so those are some of the very daunting figures that we've seen in 2020. Uh, last year, we should also set um, particular art groups such as uh, visual arts and cartoonists were particularly vulnerable, especially cartoonists that um, use their work um, to questions to oppose government policy on the pandemic and lockdown and so on. Many of them end up having to pay a high price. Um, you will see in our report that we intentionally also show some of this work um, that, that make them face a very difficult situation also. Um, in, uh, to look at visual art in particular, we've seen three, 238 cases uh, in 55 countries. Four cartoonists and visual artists were imprisoned, while 16 other were being prosecuted. Uh, and one case certainly um, died in prison, and that's in Belarus. And I think we look forward to hear more uh, on Belarus situation. Um, secondly, when we look at the content of last year report, we also see in the COVID situation uh, that linked very much to artistic freedom. Um, like most of new emerging incidents happens around the world, when it happens, very often they are used as a pretext to go after, for many governments to go after uh, dissents or those that has been opposing governments or some governments have been keep an eye on those groups for quite some time. So um, COVID-19 has been used as a pretext uh, very often in terms of disinformation, fake news and so on. And that constitutes uh, roughly about 70% of all cases in developing countries and 30% in the more like rich countries. We documented 65 artists were um, received some form of punish punishment related to criticizing or questioning government's lockdown uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, 13 detained in 10 countries, for example, um, while almost every week last year, there would be one person being prosecuted um, for questioning government policy related to COVID-19. Uh, four of these were imprisoned in three countries, and that's Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, where um, cases of artists and people working in the arts and cultural fields uh, were questioning, uh, were punished for questioning uh, this particular challenge. Um, last year, we also seen um, the incident of George Floyd and other uh, racial protests that happened uh, starting from the US uh, coming to Europe and many parts of the world. And that also has direct impact on this situation of artistic freedom. We've seen an increased number, especially in North America and Europe, where majority of restriction of artistic freedom related to racial issues exist. Um, and that's 82% in rich countries compared to a much smaller in developing countries. Uh, when it comes to restriction, censorship, artistic freedom in uh, related to racial issues. Um, the battleground has been around public spaces, removing of statues, uh, public arts that symbolize any forms of uh, colonialism or celebration of um, colonialism and other racial issues, slavery back uh, several, a few hundred years back, any forms of arts that reflect and symbolize uh, those restrictions of other freedom has been uh, a challenge. And um, we also found last year there's been a big challenge um, in terms of the use of religion's reasons to restrict freedom of expressions. 
especially blasphemy laws have been used. Uh, one of the prominent cases has been the case of Yahaya, um, a singer from Nigeria who sang one song praising God, posting his music video on WhatsApp. Uh, and as a result, his house were burned and he has to went into hiding. Um, the court in Kano State, Nigeria, which used Islam um, court or legal framework, basically pros uh, prosecute, uh, sentence him to death while he was not present in court. Um, Free Mills and a number of other partners has been campaigning for release of Yahaya, who has been um, uh, in prison, uh, sentenced to imprisonment. Um, his case is still ongoing and we're still working with lawyers to support him. Uh, but that's show just one example of how um, artistic freedom has been restricted in the name of religious freedom. Um, UN special, special Rapporteurs and Experts has made very clear in a number of occasions that we cannot use uh, hurting religious feelings as the ground for restrict artistic freedom. And the very main reason is that human rights, the main aim is to protect individual, not to protect ideology or religious doctrine. Uh, so these will continue to be the works that will be um, looking at uh, uh, address the challenge as we continue. Um, the last major finding has continued to be the use of anti-terrorism measures against artists. We see increasingly artists are being prosecuted because or as seen as related to terrorists um, and disproportionately affect minority or artists with minority backgrounds, uh, particularly in the US and Turkey where um, anti-terrorism measures have been used against artists, mostly in forms of prosecuting minority voices. Um, and that accounts now for 12% of all prosecution cases that are happening around the world. Um, leading region of using anti-terrorism measures against artists and people working in arts and culture sector has been in Africa at 34%. And interestingly, secondly, followed by Europe at 22%. Um, we've seen prosecution happen in, in many countries. Let me just jump quickly. I know I ran out of time a little bit on the, uh, the solution. I know I've been telling, sharing with you a lot of bad news and uh, uh, tough figures and numbers. But let me just say briefly a few potential solutions to address this. Uh, first of all, um, most of censorship and other form of restriction of artistic freedom happen and happen legally. That's mainly because there's laws is according to national laws. When these national laws are in fact inconsistent with international human rights standards in the first place. So that's the very first uh, solution that we need to do is to change national laws um, to make sure it comply with international standards. And interestingly, this is allowed by international laws already. When you sign an international law, when a government sign an international law, the treaty based national government have to change their national laws to comply with international standards. But this has been very slow. And this is one area that we should actually address. Otherwise, we we'll continue to see uh, growing of uh, growth of censorship and other forms of restrictions to address this law. And then secondly, Briefly, the importance of civil society and networking, that uh, we cannot rely on others or wait for situation to improve. We need to take action. We need to take turn this into campaign advocates, make our voice heard. It's very important for arts and culture sector to really come together uh, and really push the envelope also, create space um, and not just listen to you, not only shrinking space for civil society, it's become shrinking space of arts and culture. Uh, people work in this sector. And I think it's very high time to really push this back through diplomatic, through public campaigns and other forms of engagement. But I look forward to engage more on how we can actually address some of these challenges. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for this um, giving us an insight in, in the report. Um, and I think it's very worth uh, to to enlighten every case, yeah, to, to speak about um, all these cases and to know um, about consequences uh, artists uh, have to deal with all over the world. And I uh, really um, found it quite interesting to have another view on this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, discussed in our country um, on a long term about closing and opening cultural institutions. And uh, you really gave us a, in a completely another uh, aspect to think about this situation. Um, at the moment, I don't see um, any questions from the participants here, but we got some questions which were sent to us uh, in advance. And maybe um, you, as also a representative from Amnesty International, um, can uh, answer the question about the correlation of human rights and artistic freedom freedom there was a question on this how do they um, yeah cling together or what is uh, maybe a comment on this question about human rights and artistic freedom should i do this now yeah okay yes, fantastic <laughs> yeah well artistic freedom is a human right to put it very simple and it is being recognized as uh, a human rights in a number of uh, key uh, international human rights uh, law also. So it falls roughly into three broad sets. So first in the, the treaty base um, on the international um, civil and political rights, for example, recognize artistic freedom as a subset of freedom of expression. Uh, and we generally understand freedom of expression as media freedom or protecting journalists and journalists' uh, work. But actually the laws already include other forms of uh, expression, not only through journalistic work, but also creative work, fiction and nonfiction. Um, so that's the first part of artistic freedom is being covered and protected as human rights under freedom of expression. Secondly, artistic freedom is also covered as cultural rights. And this is another treaty, this is International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In the cultural rights sectors, we state very uh, simple that everyone has a right to enjoy all dimensions of cultural life, um, to share, to enjoy, to be a part of. Um, the body of the law or the content of artistic freedom has been articulated, especially by the uh, former UN rapporteurs also that look into uh, artistic freedom. Uh, and then most recently by the UN rapporteurs on freedom of opinion and expression that generate the, the more body of uh, what artistic freedom is included. And the third part is also covered by UNESCO conventions, especially 2005 conventions for the promotion and protection of diversity or cultural diversities. And this is also mentioning artistic freedom as a part of the law uh, that requires government to report back and meet certain standards. And there's a number of uh, regional uh, treaty bodies also um, whether it's in Americas or in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, that cover and make reference to artistic freedom. So it is an integral part. It is a, a subset of human rights. Um, and it's also important uh, for us to see and understand uh, artistic freedom, not an isolated human rights, but for human rights to be realized, you have to have other human rights. So the interconnectedness of all human rights. If you can't have the right to associate, the right to protest, the right to speak, to form an artist association, you also will not have artistic freedom rights. So it is not just for me to create something, but also to take part, to show, to go to protest, to go to take part. So all of human rights are interconnected. And it's really important to, um, to address and the move forward, advance artistic freedom along that line also. 
Thank you very much, uh, Suyak. I think this is a very perfect um, bridge over to the next input because um, we have the um, impression that also the last uh, four web talks that the whole uh, subject uh, on artistic freedom is so complex and we really appreciate if there's somebody to just uh, give us uh, this points on um, the orientation uh, about this um, issue. Thank you very much again. And um, now it's time again to welcome Hanna. Hanna Komar is a poet, translator, writer and activist. She studied linguistics at Minsk State Linguistic University and uh, after that took several non-degree courses or in literature and writing. She has uh, public publications both in Belarusian and international newspapers, magazines and anthologies. And uh, she um, is an author of two poet poetry collections and um, a book of translations of Charles Bukowski poetry into Belarusian. And among other projects, she is working on a documentary prose about the protests after the election of 2020 in Belarus. She has been finalist and laureate of several independent literary uh, awards. And recently, together with Dimitri Strojev, um, Hannah was awarded the 2020 Norwegian Authors Union Freedom of Speech Award. So um, very uh, warm welcome, Hannah, um, who is um, talking to us um, about the state of artistic freedom in Belarus and give us insights in her personal impressions. She has uh, been part of um, uh, uh, research on the, um, the the situation for artists in Belarus and the stage is yours, Hanna. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. And I appreciate this opportunity to be talking about Belarus. We can't uh, say enough. I'll share the presentation with you that, that I've prepared just to make it uh, more comfortable to perceive what I'm going to be talking about. As I guess all of you know, uh, since last spring, spring 2020, yeah, the repressions uh, in Belarus rolled out and the scale has been only in growing up till now and there seems to be no ending to it at times. So what I'm going to tell now is going to be based on the report uh, and uh, digest uh, prepared by the Belarusian Pen Centre and also uh, on my personal impressions. And uh, I think, yeah, so uh, over, and I'm going to be talking about the year 2021, you know, some newer information. Uh, over the three months uh, from January to March, we recorded at least. Uh, 291 cases of human rights violations against cultural workers and cultural rights in Belarus. And you can see here uh, what they are. Uh, but obviously now by May, they, there are already many more cases. Uh, and I'm going to be talking more about specific areas uh, where, you know, repressions uh, are some of the biggest. Uh, as for literature, uh, several publishers uh, have been interrogated and um, um, some booksellers as well, and their accounts are arrested, which means they can't uh, really work properly. They can't continue their work properly. Some books, uh, at least two books for now, uh, were recognized as extremists, and uh, even a trial was uh, taken for uh, a and a journalist bring in one of the books into Belarus. Uh, fortunately, uh, he was pleaded not guilty. And uh, there is also limited access to books in prisons. Uh, for example, for administrative arrests, people are only allowed to read 30 minutes a day uh, at a particular time, which you can't 
which you often can't figure out because watches are not allowed to have in prison. So you don't even know when that time when you can order to have a book uh, in the cell. Uh, then art spaces have been facing a lot of pressure both in 2020 and now in 2021. Uh, there are inspections, they come and close their spaces in various cities around Belarus, not just Minsk. And it's also connected with some festivals which can't be run because the spaces are closed. And uh, in some cases, uh, as for example, with that um, um, festival exhibition uh, about dedicated to the medical workers in Belarus, uh, even the organizers were detained. Uh, then symbols, yeah, I think you all know that white, red, white colors uh, are have become very symbolic uh, during the protest, and uh, they are persecuted, and people are persecuted for for any any use of those colors, and uh, uh, they are considered as picketing, uh, and um, or now they claimed as. Uh, propaganda of Nazism and people are punished with fines and administrative arrest. It can be arrested for socks, uh, for a hat, uh, for a ribbon, for a flag, even if it's not yours, any of that. Uh, there has been also a new way uh, the regime has been manipulating with uh, our historical memory and they have been using this term rehabilitation of Nazism very, very often now uh, to also pers uh, persecute uh, people and organizations. Uh, for example, uh, they've opened criminal cases against the Union of Poles in Belarus um, and uh, uh, some organizers and work co-workers are actually now under arrest. And uh, uh, an artist, Alice Pushkin, he was uh, also detained uh, uh, for his painting, basically. Also, people uh, keep being dismissed for uh, expressing dissent and criticism of the regime. Uh, these, they are musicians, right, uh, writers, artists, uh, etc. And there are blacklists of musicians and artists, which means that they can't perform and can't, uh, yeah, can't perform in Belarus. They are just not allowed. Um, but also, it's not all only dark, you know, there is still a lot of work going on, for example, like, as I mentioned, the Belarusian Pen Center obviously has been doing a huge work. Also, there is Belarusian Culture Solidarity Foundation, which was founded in connection with the protest and the repressions. And they do a lot, like they organize concerts to support artists and their projects. They also arrange fundraising campaigns to implement artistic projects. They provide legal and psychological support. And there is also a group within that foundation who work on the cultural policies, which we hope are, you know, to have ready once the regime collapses and we have changed of the government and fair election etc so we already have like this drafted cultural policies for for new belarus so to say and cultural resistance uh, continues uh, in various forms yeah people still create music and play music from music in the you know undergrounds and street musicians to online concerts and people still write books and publish them or try to publish them. And uh, there are plays and performances which are shown mostly again online or also underground. So a lot of art actually moved underground. You know, it's like this partisan art. Yes, and uh, people paint a lot, they design things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there is also a lot of art uh, created by actual people who are now in prisons. And that helps both them. And they send this art to us with letters, some letters, some reach us, some never don't, unfortunately, but people write books, you know, prose and poetry. A lot of people have never done that before, started, you know, writing poetry or prose and memoirs, and they draw, draw a lot. This is just two small examples, but obviously there are tons of those. And the uh, general population has become and probably has always been very creative and continues to be so. 
um, it, I just chose this, picked these two examples, uh, women with red, white, red, white uh, umbrellas, they've become legendary. And, you know, um, this is like an intervention because it's dangerous to show up with that in those colors and with that, those umbrellas, you, you actually get detained and people are get, get detained. Uh, but they still go out and that's, you know, like an act of performance, a performative act, or also just people in the various towns and neighborhoods um, uh, write letters and, you know, create also uh, some supportive art, although they are not professional artists. And also there is a huge international solidarity. Um, uh, so first of all also like people who had to flee belarus they they keep working outside belarus and uh, creating and collaborating uh, and also so what uh, but also thanks to other artists and and the cultural you know organizations and persons around the world uh, shows are staged about the events in belarus uh, there are jobs provided for the repressed uh, art workers uh, our films or films about belarus are shown at the festivals there are exhibitions held in many many like there have been a really a lot of them um, there are literary translations and publications made and artists for residences for artists and writers provide provided, et cetera, et cetera. And that is extremely important. That really uh, helps us keep going. And so, yeah, that is very in, in brief what's been going on. I, I like that quote by Roosevelt. I uh, paraphrased it a little bit. So we do what we can with what we have where we are. Uh, I can't say if successfully or not, but I'm proud uh, that we are. And I'm proud and I'm grateful to everyone who's been standing by and who, due to whom, you know, we are still resisting as well. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for this, um, yeah, very brief insight. Um, I can imagine that there is a lot more to tell us and um, um, I, I, I'm really impressed um, about the strength and the, the power uh, the artistic sector can still find to, to, yes, to stand up and to fight against um, all these restrictions. Um, do you think that, that art has a special power to um, go through these very hard times and to maybe to give also, you, you mentioned this group of uh, people with the umbrellas who weren't uh, exactly artists, but they joined some, um, some very positive, uh, I think, uh, movement. Um, do you think that art can, can really achieve that? Of course, and it can and it has achieved a lot and art has been like uh, the heart, you know, of the protest from the very beginning of it. And we could see that especially like we could see it everywhere. Uh, there, there was there, there have been a lot of uh, musical, uh, you know, like music has been helping people a lot. And that was while we were marching at those huge rallies or when we were protesting against uh, closing down the theater, you know, or uh, yeah, or when these neighbors communities uh, started forming uh, last autumn, people wouldn't uh, open, like, find out that there was Belarusian music they hadn't been aware uh, of earlier and that, uh, you know, they would arrange uh, these musical performances, which would draw a lot of people and uh, unite, unify people again. So, so, so people have become really unified around a culture and thanks to culture. And um, also culture and, and arts, they give people this uh, energy, I think, you know, it's like charges, charges them. It gives, it's because it's an opportunity to reflect. It's also, an, it, it's, it's a way to support each other, to express what's in other ways, it's really hard to express, but with need, needs this, you know, to be poured out. Otherwise it's just impossible to, to go on. Uh, 
Yes, and uh, I'm really fascinated by how creative the Belarusian people in general are. Not only professional, obviously professional uh, artists, musicians, etc., but just not professional, just uh, people who you would not exp expect um, to be that creative. Yeah. That's great to know. Um, I, I forget uh, to mention that we are roughly uh, about 80% um, persons attending from Germany here in our round, only a few from um, broader Europe, uh, none from the international sector. This was uh, the result of our little poll. But um, Maybe you have something you can, um, or some hints, how we, especially from, from Germany and from the German cultural sector, can support you uh, in, your, in your special situation. What, what can be some hints, what we can do? Yeah, that's always a good question. And, you know, um... I try to not think about uh, how the regime is uh, ignoring every every kind of say because I believe that uh, pressure should be put uh, on the regime on the on these official institutions you know from from different countries from their politicians from their organizations and then I I see how it's not. Uh, working and I, I get upset but I believe we still need to you know that still needs to be done yeah. until it works and also all the work that has been done you know uh, inviting us to talk about Belarus uh, it matters as I mentioned staging performances you know making publications doing exhibitions it also works and if there is uh, help like practical, you know, like workplaces or places to study for the expelled students or uh, for the dismissed professionals, uh, places to work, some residences uh, or for those in exile or, you know, just for to work on some projects, they are all, all needed and that is all great help. Mm -hmm. And sharing information, you know, just the simple yeah. thing that everybody can do is share information, just sharing, posting, reposting, keeping it, keeping it, the agenda, you know, uh, in the in this keep case. Keep the light on keep what is going on there. Yeah, yeah, because it's still going on. And yeah. there is still a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We know uh, that you uh, are right into this um, special situation and that uh, every day some, something new happens where you need the support and um, social media is uh, some possibility also to, um, to spread this. I um, posted a link, the link Ulrike Blumreich, she did an interview with you in the uh, Kulturpolitische Mitteilung and I posted the text uh, here so that everybody who wanted uh, wants to know more about you and your special situation in Belarus can um, can read this um, and I will I'm sure that we have uh, for our final discussion a lot of material and that Sri Lak uh, Pipat and uh, Daniel Gard will have maybe also some, some hints or questions for you. Um, I see a little raising head, but um, I uh, would ask you to um, write your questions into um, the Q&A and we will take them later for our discussion. Many thanks, Han for your um, speech and your insights uh, in the situation and um, we will meet at the discussion at the end and uh, see how many questions um, the participants maybe have uh, on your special situation. And our last input is uh, right to be held now by um, Dr. Daniel Gard. Um, he is a cultural policy uh, 
researcher and since two 2012 the managing director of the Hildesheim UNESCO chair in cultural policy for the arts and development with a focus on artistic freedom. So he is uh, right, the right person to give us uh, this last uh, perspective on our topic. Daniel is networking in the arts sector and focuses on the transformative power of the arts and um, he worked as an advisor for the German Development Service, the German UNESCO Commission and the Goethe Institute and uh, far more uh, institutions um, and he will now uh, give us some insights also into the arts rights justice program and the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this roundtable. Such an important um, field and um, so very needed to exchange and ongoingly talk about what are the right approaches uh, to improve the, uh, the very many, many fault situations around the globe. So um, let me um, speak a little about this this arts rights justice program, I think it's a good um, continuation uh, uh, within this three different perspectives uh, on our today's talk. So uh, since 40 years, Hildesheim trains cultural managers, cultural policy makers, curators, theater educators, and many more. But so far we did this mainly for the German arts sector. And as UNESCO chair, since 2012, we started to collaborate in professional trainings abroad uh, and the relation between cultural policy and the freedom of the arts turned out to be a very needed field for action. So what frameworks are needed to ensure the protection and promotion of artistic freedom? Artistic creation is deeply related to social, societal and political transformation. I think we already understood this a little by um, seeing the uh, or getting this insight, this small insight into the recent situation in Belarus. And um, it's so very important to um, investigate that field and to understand what can be really done to improve the situation. So um, we do this. Um, at Hildesheim on the basis of our German understanding of culture policy as it, as it is rooted in our basic law, the arts are free. So artistic freedom is part of the basic right for communication situated in the democratic structure of the Federal Republic of Germany. But many other countries around the globe and not only within Europe. So a really worldwide defined similar understandings and several UN documents and UNESCO documents um, as Sriok already referred to, especially the recent one, recent in question marks from 2005, the Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions show that the aim to protect and promote artistic freedom has a global reach beyond national interpretations. Um, and we also have to add that there is a gap between existing national law and what is happening in real life. So sometimes law already exists to protect and promote artistic freedom, but sometimes, or in many cases, uh, sadly to say, this law is not respected or it's, um, relativated because of other existing law. Maybe we can discuss that a bit later on. So what can we observe? We can observe a need for safe haven residencies, though most residencies are based in Europe only so far. Second, we can observe an increase of international reporting and analysis by official actors like UN and UNESCO, but as important, the independent civil society. So uh, here we have a lot of actors who look like free muse, look uh, from a worldwide, pers worldwide perspective on that field, but we also have a variety of actors who have a specific view and knowledge on national situations, like uh, Racine in Morocco did this for Morocco, or um, Sia Band um, did that for Turkey, but um, so there is a variety of institutions doing reporting and analysis, a very needed additional field. Third, um, an ongoing, um, it's ongoing um, 
uh, in, in parts, uh, growing restrictions in free mobility of artists and further professionals in the art sector. It's a very important additional field. We do not just talk about violence and persecution, which is a very important field to talk about. But in addition, we need to talk about the restrictions within mobility, which highly affect the field of artistic freedom as well. Fourth, self-censorship, um, as in many local situations, is the only way to continue working and at the same time avoid restrictions and persecutions and further forms of violence. So imagine an art, art world where artists do not need to include some form of self-censorship. Uh, what uh, could be, what is the potential, the transformative potential within this um, artistic production which is not able to take place. And fifth, um, I would say there is a strong uh, missing um, um, a, a, of national and local debates about artistic freedom. Um, I think in almost every country there, there are circles who talk about um, artistic freedom and the lack and the reasons and what can be done. But um, I think there uh, is a strong need for more public, uh, diverse, different actors with different opinions meeting to talk about what is our common sense, our idea of artistic freedom. So um, what needs to be done? Uh, the UNESCO chair at Hildesheim had been asked uh, by several actors from civil society to contribute to this field by creating a training platform to improve the activities to protect and promote artistic freedom. So uh, we invited, uh, we, in, we interviewed some 30 actors in the field to further understand what the most fitting structure would look like. So as a result, the Arts Rights Justice Academy was born as a one week training for a group of 30 young professionals from, coming from all world regions, guided by a moderate and, and moderated by eight facilitators. So um, for instance, Farida Shahid as the former special rapporteur on cultural rights had been one of those facilitators. Um, and this academy is accompanied to the Arts Rights Justice online library to give free access to the most important literature, analysis, reports, toolkits, and guides at one spot. Um, so as an additional idea to um, spread existing knowledge and to exchange existing knowledge in that very field. So, but how, what could we say about the target group of such a training? Which groups need professional training? So we started with a focus on training the icon safe haven managers, also because the International City of Refuge Network, uh, that's ICORN, um, had been the main actor to reach out to us, uh, but uh, this quickly turned out to be much too much focused on one out of many important f uh, actors in this field. And of course, it is it was much too much Eurocentric, as most, um, as I already said, most safe haven residents, safe haven residences are placed within Europe. So, but still, uh, the first out of four target groups we identified are the cultural managers or other professionals from the arts sector, um, um, because um, a safe haven program is more than just an artist's residency. There are similarities, there are equal parts, but uh, there is much more uh, to be understood and to do if you uh, deal with an artist who had to escape from his former, her former region, uh, who is confronted with m different forms, trauma and other um, serious um, issues, uh, not knowing about the future, how to go on, uh, working as an artist um, um, and all the many uh, is, um, related area to this. But also uh, this group of cultural managers is important because the lacks of freedom also intervene with the general arts activities. If, if it is arts exhibitions, music festivals or theater performances, if it is mobility, mainly visa access needs to be uh, named here or reactions of intolerances within a society, for example, the phenomena of cancel culture. So besides the cultural managers, we focused at three other uh, target 
groups. So the artists themselves as well, as some artists are very interested in contributing to a better infrastructure for the arts, artistic production and arts education or mediation, um, but also the aim of many artists to fuel societal debate. Um, so uh, we there was a discussion, should we include or exclude the artists? And we clearly said, yes, they need to be part of this group of 30 people um, to be uh, trained in, in a one week training. Third group are the lawyers, um, lawyers who work in the field of human rights, freedom of opinion, freedom of speech, or uh, in the arts in specific. Um, why that? Um, because um, it is about how to protect and promote artists and cultural workers from a legal perspective. And parallel to this, uh, it is also sadly to be said, um, how to ensure the safety of the lawyers, because this is an additional phenomenon we can observe uh, that it's not only about the first stage of actors who are persecuted and, and threatened and so on, it's also about the people around uh, that first, first stage of people. And fourth, um, it's the wider group of human rights defenders um, is because especially in situ situations of conflict, conflict, we can observe that more artists are focusing within their artistic production on political and social ills. And at the same time, we saw this also with the case uh, example of Belarus, um, more and more human rights activists use creative and artistic methods to distribute their message. So um, is, this is a very important field. Probably there are further ones, but uh, one thing I think is, it's very important to make clear, we need to look at this um, field of artistic freedom from a very interdisciplinary approach. If we restrict it to one smaller area, it does not work out. Um, in uh, addition to what uh, Srirak explained to us about the definition of human rights or the re relation of artistic freedom and human rights. So collaboration seems to be an important approach to improve the situation. All actions uh, by the Arts Rights Justice Program, for example, are part of a global informal initiative, or we maybe could say community ex of exchange, including ICON, PAN, Martin Roth Initiative, or Free Muse, the Artists at Risk Connection, and many, many more. And uh, I think this is the crucial part within collaboration is a key to um, go on. So finally, where do we stand? It is obvious uh, that professional training is very needed to build up fitting frameworks and infrastructure. Actually, this is not a, uh, a new finding. If we want to improve something, we need professional training. This is independent from the arts, etc. But um, we see that in many countries, especially out of Europe, uh, there is almost no offer of very limited access to professional training. So um, this is an ongoing task. Um, there is a clear need to develop and widen approaches besides safe haven relocation, because relocation in many cases is not the first choice for the people who um, need or think about a need for relocation, um, especially if relocation means a continental move, mainly to Europe. Many artists fear to lose touch with their aim to contribute to the transformation of their home countries, for example. Uh, but there are further um, issues why a relocation uh, should be one out of many possible um, uh, options uh, to get support and protection and so on. So how to build up safe haven residences all around the world is one issue here. How to avoid the situation of a need to relocate. Uh, what are fitting protection mechanisms which finally are accepted in a specific national local context. Additional activities to the very important reporting on lacks of artistic freedoms are needed. What is the next step once viola violations of artistic freedom have been made visible? So um, that's uh, maybe we can also discuss this um, in a minute. And lately, um, by listening to all former sessions of this web talk series, I clearly see a need to initiate roundtables for discussion in all countries on the globe. We need further communication. We need exchanges. We need to understand and distribute or mediate what are fundamental human rights, which stay to be untouchable 
And we also need to understand where local interpretations are the key to local acceptance, but by not diluting the core impetus of the ongoing aim to transform societies towards something better. So what are the human rights which are universal, untouchable, and where are the keys to situate them into the local understandings, interpretations, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you for also the conclusion on our uh, web talk series uh, and uh, the, the needs um, which you see uh, over the uh, whole discussion. And uh, I think that, that uh, the um, possibility to exchange is very, very important. Um, I have one question here in the F&A, which was, uh, I think, uh, meant for uh, everybody of you. And I think we can also switch over into the main discussion. Um, Birgit Ellinghaus, she, she asks um, herself and you <laughs> if, uh, uh, if there is an experience um, about the shrinking artistic freedom of, of uh, expression related to the closed borders and the absence of tourism absence of artistical uh, cultural exchange projects you you mentioned the the, uh, the importance of collaboration and um, limited presence of international uh, exchange and media maybe uh, Daniel you you just mentioned the the importance of exchange uh, even of uh, cultural projects and um, um, over borders uh, so maybe you can can answer this comment of Birgit. Well, let me let me focus on one issue. Um, I questioned um, this focus on relocation. And at the same time, uh, we need to clearly say it's so very important to offer this opportunity uh, because there is quite a number of um, artists and further out of, uh, persons out of the cre uh, creative sector where relocation is the only option. And obviously, I mean, um, due, due to the pandemic, um, being confronted with closed borders uh, all around the globe um, and further restrictions, this is, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's um, what you, you see, I, I don't know the words um, because um, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of especially European actors who have been who are active in this field, they were just not able um, to to do what uh, to work in the structures which they designed. And at the same time, you cannot just right away create um, local structures which in a way offer a same opportunity to protect to shelter people who need protection. Um, so um, and uh, in, in addition to that, what I think Srirak already talked about it. Um, we, we see that due to the pandemic uh, and peril, uh, and also uh, due to this uh, ongoing phenomenon and discussion about terrorism, we see that um, artistic freedom um, is even more uh, an issue for, for the creative sector. And um, uh, it's uh, probably because it's quite an easy way for power structures, for local governments, for other uh, people who want to, uh, to, who fight for their own uh, ideas um, to just quickly use this um, situation. Um, so um, um, I just see that um, the existing infrastructures to protect and promote, uh, they are not stable enough. They, they are not fitting enough into uh, the, the manifold situations we have. And so there is a clear task for all the actors to, to uh, additionally think about it. Maybe let me add one last thing. Um, I am a member of the um, 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 consulting committee to the Martin Roth Initiative, so that uh, the, the program, quite new program of uh, IFA and Goethe Institute, in addition to ICON. And um, they uh, started to not just um, um, create relocation spaces within Germany, they also, uh, from the beginning on, thought there is a clear need to think of what could be solutions um, within the regions. Um, but uh, the political um, support 
support for uh, the, uh, or maybe uh, even more, uh, the, the problems by um, the rules of how to stream the budget of such a program um, are um, our enemies in finding easy um, solutions to create local infrastructures. So um, we are in a journey and uh, we that the pandemic shows us that um, there are huge lacks uh, which do not uh, fully fit into the needs of um, the the artists in um, in that many difficult situations. Hmm. Um, I want to ask Sriak. Uh, you were mentioned in uh, this uh, issue. Daniel just mentioned um, he he talked about safe havens and he uh, also um, points out uh, how important this uh, secure places uh, are. Also, Hannah, she she uh, talk, taught us uh, that it's important to invite artists to speak and to to go into specific programs. Do you have any program or do you see also via your monitoring that this has an impact if there are um, a lot of such programs or invitations? Thank you very much for, for the questions. Um, I absolutely agree with Daniel. I think the, uh, the residency programs Uh, which has now gaining momentum and uh, have enjoyed a, a good level of resources. I mean, comparatively to other areas of work, um, it's very relevant, it's valid and very needed and should be continued. Um, but at the same time, I think we're increasing the needs to connect the dots also, because in most cases, when artists are being relocated from where they forced to leave the country in the first place. If they come and stay in Europe for three months up to two years, the difficulties will be when they go back and also whether European governments are willing you know, to put up a visa as a refugee after the end of two years, which empirically um, is not for everybody. Then so there are some uh, artists, some of them that I interview for our reports uh, have to be in hiding in a number of uh, European cities after the residency program is finished. They did not get visa from European government and they could not go back home because they already give interviews to the Western media. So they're basically put in a, a difficult situation. Um, so there's some questions about the model. And I think one solution to this is to connect the dots uh, because there's organization like Free Meals and Pens and others that have done research and advocacy work. Um, we're also looking at, you know, when someone is, is injured, you provide first aid, yes, that's accessory. But at the same time, we need to address root causes, why those artists left the country in the first place. And if laws and policies and system hasn't changed, and we acknowledge that there are some other countries where dictators or authoritarian regimes has been ongoing for decades, Uh, and obviously we know this change will take time, but we can also take one baby step at a time, remove certain clauses of laws or having debate. Important one is also to connect with local NGOs, especially in the global south. And we can't do this by having international NGOs sitting in Europe. We just need to support local uh, NGOs, whether in Myanmar, they are struggling now in Thailand or you know, any countries in Africa. And, and those will be the part that we're looking at. So at Free Meals, we also develop a program called Global Action Network. So we're trying to bring artists uh, and arts and culture organizations, uh, both at the national level to come together and forms a national network. And, and also they could do a thematic network across and we started with LGBTI artists from around the world, wherever the countries, whichever the countries they are from, to come together and really push back all these restrictions around LGBTI expressions, LGBTI artists who basically face uh, serious prosecutions in, in many uh, countries. So those are some of the things that we recognize that individually we can also make a difference so that we don't feel victimized We can also engage 
Uh, we've been speaking with ICON, for example, about the possibility of having arti artists at risk for being relocated to Europe to also start something to address root causes that make them left the country. You know, very basic things such as telling stories and also come together as a group to advocate for changes, whatever the, the advocacy target could be. So those are some of the initiatives that uh, we think we'll be looking at. Um, and most recently, FEMU's just started um, what we call a small changes project uh, in three countries in the Middle East. And this is to invite um, people in arts and culture, artists and arts organizations uh, to come up with their ideas, to bring their creativities. Um, we put very simple, we put up in a, a, a public space. If you know how to change the world in six months and under 1000 euros, write to us and uh, then we'll see what we can do together and generate that creativity and use arts and culture to make a difference. Even though that difference can be very small, could be in their community, could be in their school or universities, whatever. Um, but that's how we, we believe in individual power that can use arts and culture for social changes also. Mm. So we'll be supporting roughly 15 projects in three countries and then bring these uh, participants together to exchange and engage with governments to open up their cultural policies, uh, advocate that their cultural policy should be human rights based cultural policy. And what does that mean to have a human rights based cultural policy? Um, and what's the implication for how to operationalize such policies that based on human rights. Mm. And that's also to uh, recall back um, the UN Rapporteurs when we work in the, in the field of cultural uh, fields, we should not only say we work in culture, but the, the right the cultural rights to realize, to bring human rights language into cultural policy. That's just very important for us to address all forms of dimensions of it. Mm. Um, I can imagine that Hannah has a very special opinion on the question of relocation. You, you mentioned um, in your in, input that it is also important, um, like Suyaki taught about the dots, uh, which uh, has to have to be combined, that there are um, artists uh, abroad that you can have this um, strong connection and support from uh, Belarusian artists uh, abroad, but what do you think uh, on this issue of uh, relocation? Yeah, I've been listening to the to the other speakers and have been, you know, uh, have some insights, especially when Daniel was talking about that. Yeah, relocation relocation opportunities are essential and that cannot be overestimated. But the how about those who want to stay in their countries but keep working on the projects and I've realized actually I'm one of those persons you know um, my situation is not bad enough for me to flee so I don't at least yet, yet as I say uh, so I don't think that I have to flee now you know persecution mm. but there are projects as that you know about the writing projects that I'd like to ca to carry on but and I'm sure there are other people who have those you know projects in mind but um, you lack resources for example for them you know uh, in some way and that's something that has been on my mind uh, for a lot of for, for a long time I know that in developed countries and democracies this there are like culture councils uh, that provide funding for projects you know say I have this idea of the project that I believe is essential for, for the uh, for the society right um, but uh, and and but to implement it I need a lot of time and a lot of effort so basically I need to make it my job for up from several months up to I don't know years right and so uh, then you apply with that project and the cultural council say provides you the bursary yeah and sometimes I, I, I feel like we're really in need of that kind of opportunities, but I can't obviously because I'm more, you know, of a writer than a politician um, or, yeah, so 
I know there is a need for that, but I, it's very hard for me to know who, who, or to, to say how it can be done. Uh, but uh, also the, the situation with the Belarusian culture has become has been very interesting in terms that uh, previously to the protest and uh, the culture was quite closed in, yeah. And because of the fact that a lot of people had to immigrate, you know, uh, to they were either lost jobs or they had to flee the persecution. And they were, thanks to the huge, really, really immense uh, international support of the creative community, of the cultural community, of the activist community, uh, the people went out to different other countries and they were invited to participate in international projects and collaborations and to make their contribution. And that's how... Uh, they build more connections and how Belarusian culture and art have become widely known, more widely known. And so later, and I hope soon, we all hope, we want to hope soon, they will be able to bring it back, you know, like they, the people will come back to Belarus, but the connections will stay. And the network will stay. That is a very interesting and unexpected result of like the positive result of these horrible events. Uh, yeah, so yeah, what I'm trying to say is that yes, relocation is important for some people. For others, it's a, it would be very important to have opportunities to work on their projects, on the essential projects put inside uh, their countries. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw Daniel raising his hand and Srirak, you also wanted to, to reply on the comment of Anna. Um, you have your microphone open. Maybe it's better to just uh, show me your hand because uh, then uh, the pictures uh, are not switching, dancing around. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, to Hanna um, there is a relation. Change needs long breath. I think that's um, uh, that's the the formula for for the globe. Um, and every situation is different. Uh, but um, if we look uh, into the the last months uh, um, about um, what has happening in Ukraine in Belarus and uh, but in Ukraine actually the same. Um, if I look into um, my observations from Germany, you know, this difficulty in uh, the, the, uh, the, the reality of a media agenda, you know, once things are on top of the agenda, then, for instance, uh, the German foreign minister or uh, the European Union, they started to act. But once it's, uh, there is, you know, it's, it's time is counting up a couple of days, uh, it's off of the agenda. And then this uh, political level is also, well, sometimes it's ongoing, we just don't see it as citizens, but uh, in many cases, the pressure is, is less. Uh, so what actually needs to be done to support the long breath, um, especially uh, for those who are within the country? Um, I think there is um, a clear relation also um, to um, the, the, the link between those who, um, who relocated and who stay. Um, and in addition, uh, what could all the others, the Europeans, but also from other world regions, there was one uh, crucial finding at the Artrise Justice Academy that, um, you know, um, a young professional from Uganda had a great idea uh, to the um, problem of a, um, a participant from India, for instance, you know, uh, so connections you could not imagine, uh, they are happening once you have time, once you have gained time. And so um, I think we need further, um, further support, if it's financially, if it's other infrastructure to support the long breath. And then I think step by step, uh, we will be able to do something. That's a great empowerment. And uh, maybe Sulirak, you have also something you can give. I think Hannah, she's the one who is in need for uh, this empowerment uh, directly right now. Um, you have some hints for her or something you can um, give her as a supportive comment. Well, you have to open your microphone. Yeah, just to share ideas. Um, and I think 
Hannah has done fantastic work already um, getting the information, you know, all of this work that uh, that needs to be done, the basic. Um, I mean, it, it depends on the short and long term goals, also, what Daniel mentioned. And I mean, to be looking for the long run, then building capacity, you know, getting resources for building institutions so that this would not be only ad hoc short term work. Um, then those could be, you know, something to really looking at building organization uh, development and capacity to continue to do the work and advocate for human rights of arts and culture sector in particular. When it comes to advocacy in a situation like this, um, experience from what we have learned and happy to share is this work best when we go intersectional. So um, that we don't only carrying the flag of artistic freedom is being violated you know, in this country, but also to interact with other human rights issues. I mean, the, the reality, wherever the platform, most of the time, uh, artistic freedom tend to be seen as smaller issue or smaller human rights issues, even though we say, you know, in officially all human rights are equal, are all interrelated. But when it comes to competing for space, for media, limited space um, agenda, whether at the EU or elsewhere at the UN, um, you always have to go. This is also why when we advocate, we go with gender groups, then we bring women's rights and artistic freedom, um, whether it's an LGBT issue or anti-terrorism measures, we can't just say, um, look, artists are being uh, accused of being terrorists. And then we engage with uh, the groups of anti-terrorism and human rights as a, a working group. So we kind of um, bring artistic freedom issues into various of those issues rather than carrying an artistic freedom flag alone. So there's a variety of a long-term strategic approach that we might building institution, building capacity, building network, uh, and at the same time, a bit more tactical when we want to raise profiles and other issues that might looking at short-term tactical approach of how to get this information to affect any policy change, uh, short-term and long-term. Um, I, but certainly, I think in the arts and culture, artistic freedom, most of us are still very small organization. We basically consist of small organization when you compare to other um, bigger human rights organization, you have amnesty with thousands of staff members or article 19 with 200 300 plus staff members, but most of us in the artistic freedom fields are organization under 10 staff and the importance of really connecting uh, helping each other and makes our voice heard I think that's very important. Um, there's avenues such as uh, what Free Muse and our partner Culture Action Europe trying to uh, convene is the, uh, the, um, the European Artistic Freedom Coalition that we invited about 30 organizations in Europe to come together um, every from every quarter to two quarters to actually looking at what's the common challenges and what we can take the message to the um, European Parliament as well as the European Commission. So those are some of the avenues that we also support uh, a bit of a loose network, um, but we, we share common challenges and purposes. Uh, and we engage through European democracy action and other uh, European recovery uh, for culture. So there's some um, very good breakthrough in terms of our advocacy also in the European context. So those are some of the um, opportunity that I think we should certainly continue but uh, the main one is really keep it up, really keeping the good work and uh, never give up. I think it's really connect with others. Thank you. That sounds yeah. promising. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, maybe you have one last comment, Hannah. We, we uh, try to, to send you all the power we maybe take away from this little round table um, you have uh, more people to, to connect to your networking um, 
uh, activities. Um, and I think Daniel and Surirak will be there if you have any uh, questions. And and um, yeah, I, I think Daniel, you you said one of the uh, most important sentences to, today that uh, we all should work for um, the one issue to make the world a better one. <laughs> to transform it um, to, yeah, maybe this is uh, something which uh, is uh, a 360 degree view we need and to look in every direction. And um, I thank you very much for this uh, insight. Um, and I think all the participants, uh, they really appreciate it to um, know about what is going on and to know about programs and to know about little possibilities of solutions and to know for instance also about the way how to support so i i at the end i will um give this uh, uh, appellation to all of you that uh, stay at the side of um, artists um, who need this support. And um, I also find the idea of um, continuing exchange, uh, which you mentioned, Daniel, um, in, in the cultural policy sector, very important. And I'm uh, quite sure that, the, um, that there will be more exchange. For today, I say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the people uh, participating, giving us one question, sending questions in advance. And thank you for all the attendees of this um, sixth series of uh, web talks uh, on artistic freedom. We had a quite great range of perspectives and today I think these three perspectives were very, very important. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Suirak and Daniel. Um, uh, I send my warm greetings to Copenhagen, right, Suirak? Uh, yes. And um, Hannover and to Hanna Minsk, yeah, and um, stay strong, stay uh, healthy.